This is Franklin Rye, and welcome back to Political Spirits. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, let's talk about the ongoing censorship of conservative voices by tech companies. It's a subject that we've heard about before, but it took a particularly frightening turn this week when Facebook and Instagram announced they would be banning a number of prominent voices on their platforms because they're, quote, dangerous. Of the prominent voices, all except Louis Farrakhan are on the conservative side of the fence. That didn't stop the Washington Post from labeling Louis Farrakhan as a conservative. Just further evidence of the degeneration of major newspapers as purported centers of journalistic excellence. What makes the latest move particularly frightening is that Facebook announced that it wasn't simply banning those individuals or entities from its platform, but rather, in addition, it was prohibiting others on its platform from publishing or circulating those individuals' or entities' content on the platform. It seems that the corporate left has ramped up the level of censorship it's willing to endorse. And as I've noted in previous podcasts, the left is the dominant perspective of corporate leadership in America, either because of their actual views or because of fear of the reaction of the left-wing mob. For further evidence that the corporate left has ramped things up, Look to the statement made by Babbel when it announced that it was pulling its ads from Tucker Carlson tonight. It didn't just say it was pulling its ads. It referred to the show as repugnant. It didn't just say it wouldn't be advertising on the show going forward. It actually said that it was blacklisting the show. Think about that. For decades, we've been told that the concept of blacklisting is what is repugnant. There have been endless numbers of television dramas and documentaries and movies made about blacklisting in Hollywood and the McCarthy era. Now we have a corporation willing to use the term blacklisting and apparently doing so with pride to describe the action it took. As I've said in prior podcasts, when corporations pull their ads from news and opinion shows because of pressure from activists who object to the news and opinions they present, those corporations are aligning themselves with efforts to censor. Not with efforts to ensure that the public hears rebuttals, but rather efforts to ensure that the public never hears the news and opinion to begin with. We should all view that effort to censor as repugnant, and we should identify those companies with that obnoxious censorship, regardless of whether the news and opinion show is on the left or on the right. As I've said before, if a company can't handle the fact that news and opinion shows make presentations that some people agree with and some people disagree with, sometimes vociferously, then they should restrict their advertising to Nickelodeon. I'm pretty sure no one objects to SpongeBob. Now back to Facebook and Instagram. The digital marketplace has replaced the town square as the place where political conversations occur. The fact that Facebook and Instagram are not government entities should not protect them from restriction. The actions they are taking restricts the ability of the American public to engage in political conversations. They restrict the ability of the American public to obtain political news and opinion. They're not small enterprises. They are dominant in the marketplace. They have an almost overwhelming ability to influence the outcome of elections. The fact that the target individuals and entities, such as Alex Jones and Milo Yiannopoulos, for example, have said offensive and insensitive things is, frankly, irrelevant. Far too often these days, we seem to have forgotten the power of the rebuttal. That is how you deal with offensive and insensitive statements. And frankly, if you can't rebut them, maybe there's more to the statements than you think, notwithstanding the fact that they may be offensive and insensitive. The bottom line is that Facebook and Instagram are too powerful and too prominent in public discourse to be allowed to get away with this censorship. 
Will the government take action in the near future? I don't know. But when you combine the steps that they're taking with the fact that various banks and payment processors are shutting down use of their services by multiple conservative commentators, this really looks like the beginning of a Chinese social credit system in America. It must be stopped. This is one more reason why I say that for the good of the country, and frankly for the good of the Democratic Party, the Democrats must suffer a terrible defeat in 2020 so that they're forced to move back to the center. Perhaps with the move to the center, even the Democrats will see just how terrifying the censorship by tech companies and the referenced restrictive actions by banks is for the future of our free speech rights in America. Next topic. If everybody's Hitler, nobody's Hitler. I've been around a while, and I've been interested in politics virtually since birth. Well, okay, maybe a bit later than that. I recall how upset I was when Jimmy Carter won the presidency in 1976. I really felt it was a disaster for the country. In the end, from a purely economic perspective, it was pretty disastrous. At the time, I was young, not out on my own, not supporting myself, and my father was able to keep his job throughout the severe recession and skyrocketing inflation. That stagflation you may have heard about. So I came through it relatively unscathed. But millions of others were not so lucky. For all of his economic failures, Jimmy Carter did do two good things. He negotiated the Camp David peace accords, and he deregulated the trucking industry. Both those successes have borne fruit for the country ever since. I do consider, and many others do as well, Jimmy Carter to be one of the worst presidents in history. But even he had successes, as I noted. As much as I was upset with his electoral win, I didn't obsess over it. I sat back and gave him a chance to succeed. In the end, I concluded he was as bad as I thought he would be, and when I had a chance to vote for Ronald Reagan in 1980, I did so with overwhelming enthusiasm. But even as I did so, and as I publicly expressed how bad a president I considered Jimmy Carter to be, I never characterized him as evil. In fact, I was very upset when Jesse Jackson called Jimmy Carter a racist for firing Andrew Young, who was ambassador to the U.N., I was upset because even though I couldn't stand Jimmy Carter as a president, there was absolutely no evidence that he was a racist. I believed then, as I believe now, that it is fundamentally wrong, it is immoral, to call someone a racist when you don't have solid evidence that they are in fact a racist. Unfortunately, it's all too common now to use the charge of racism as a weapon to label those who disagree with you, most commonly if they're on the right side of the political spectrum, as racists. Far too many people today, generally on the left, label conservatives as racists, even if they don't know anything about them. That's particularly true if the persons being labeled as a racist happen to support President Trump. This immoral practice is damaging the country in two very significant ways. First of all, it's gutting the impact of the term racist. In a country which once held blacks in human bondage, fought a civil war to rid itself of that abomination, and then systematically deprived blacks of their civil rights in the aftermath of the civil war and beyond, being labeled as a racist should be an overwhelming metaphysical gut punch. It should be the most shameful label of all. But the term has been so overused, so misapplied, that its impact is vanishing. So many people have been falsely labeled that we could reach a point where the label is ignored and viewed as irrelevant even when it's deserved. The immoral practice of labeling those who oppose you as racist without substantial evidence to support the charge is doing great damage to the country, if for no other reason than the fact that it's undermining the impact of the label. But that's not the only harm being done by the immoral practice of applying the label without adequate support. The other damage is being done by undermining our society. It discourages people from talking to each other, 
It discourages them from exchanging opinions. Who wants to risk being labeled a racist by someone who disagrees with your political views? If we stand silent, if we don't talk to each other, our society doesn't work. Our political system doesn't work. And this won't be a very nice place to live. So is overuse of the term racist the only example of unsupported labeling by the left? Far from it. Calling a politician Hitler has become so common recently that I've lost track of the number of times somebody, in response, has made the cogent point that if everybody's Hitler, nobody's Hitler. When I was young, the Anti-Defamation League used to regularly chastise people who label fellow Americans and other politicians as Hitler based on political disagreements. The point the ADL would make was that it was an affront to the Jewish people, many of whom had relatives who died in the Holocaust, to downplay the horror of the Holocaust and the overwhelming evil of Adolf Hitler by labeling others as Hitler simply because you disagree with their politics. I don't see that point being made so often anymore. Perhaps it's because the distasteful practice of labeling your opponents as Hitler has become so common that it would be a never-ending stream of press releases from the ADL. Or perhaps releases are issued, but the press doesn't even report on them because the practice of labeling your opponents as Hitler has become so common. I had an exchange recently with someone on the left side of the political spectrum. He did something that I found shocking. He compared Vice President Mike Pence to Joseph Mengele. That floored me. We all know about the overwhelming evil of Adolf Hitler, but not everybody knows about the gory and disgusting details of Joseph Mengele's actions in Nazi Germany. Obviously, the scale of his criminality could not approach Hitler's, but the fact that he was a doctor, a physician, and therefore someone who presumably swore an oath to protect human life makes his actions almost more vile and shocking than you can imagine. Mengele would work the ramp at Auschwitz where thousands of prisoners, primarily Jews, would arrive. He would decide who would go to the work camp and who would go immediately to the gas chambers. Mengele also conducted a wide range of medical experiments on the prisoners, often Jewish or gypsy children, and often twins he would harvest body parts from living concentration camp prisoners, often killing them in the process. Alternatively, he would have them murdered to harvest the parts. Go to encyclopedia.ushmm.org, the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, for a confirmation of these facts and more on this profoundly cruel individual and his horrific crimes. So knowing the depths of the evil of Joseph Mengele, you can understand how shocked I was that the person with whom I was talking compared Vice President Pence to him. I offered him a chance to take it back. I noted that Mengele was a Nazi physician who conducted horrific experiments and murdered huge numbers of Jews in the Holocaust, and cautioned him that comparing Pence to him minimized the horror of the Holocaust. I suggested that he take it back. Perhaps I was being naive, but in all honesty, I thought he would. Instead, he insisted that he stood by what he said and in defense claimed that Pence supported gay conversion therapy. Actually, I don't think the record supports that claim. Even the Washington Post, in an April 7, 2019 fact-checker report, has advised that the claim about Mike Pence is not in fact based on anything he has ever said. He hasn't said he supported gay conversion therapy. It's based on the claim that Pence pushed for organizations that pursue gay conversion therapy in a campaign flyer from about 20 years ago. But the Washington Post concluded there's little support for that claim, and that the better argument is that in the flyer his campaign was pushing to ensure that the HIV research funding bill being addressed at the time included funding for organizations which support safe sex practices. So think about the situation we face in America, where in political discussions between two individual Americans, one will claim that the current vice president of the U.S. is comparable to one of the most evil persons ever to walk the face of the earth, and then refuse to take it back when given the chance. Some would say that's why we can't have those discussions. I still say, and will continue to say 
that we must have those discussions. We have to understand what our fellow Americans think. We have to talk to each other. That is our right, and I would say it's our obligation. It won't always happen, but sometimes our fellow Americans will come to realize that we just disagree about politics, and that is par for the course in a republic. Next topic. Joe Biden's Speech Problems Joe Biden gave his first rally speech of his campaign for the Democratic nomination in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and a number of commentators observed that there was something strange about his speech. Not the words he was saying, but rather how he was saying them. Some people contended that he was slurring his words. I watched a collection of various segments of the speech where he did appear to be slurring words mispronouncing words, cutting words off so that they were incomplete, generally screwing up certain portions of the delivery. Now, I've never thought Joe Biden was a particularly great speaker, but I don't remember him making these mistakes in the past. So I started doing some research regarding his prior speeches. Now, this had the potential to get me really worked up and engaged. There were people floating the idea that Joe Biden had a stroke, for example. That would be horrible, of course, but the idea that that may have happened and been covered up was something that was intriguing for anybody that follows politics. That would be the type of thing that would have obviously caused a reconsideration of running and would certainly delay an announcement, the kind of things that actually happened along the path to Biden actually announcing formally that he was running for the Democrat nomination for president. Having said that, there was absolutely no medical or other evidence provided of any such thing having happened to Joe Biden, other than the fact that he was slurring and otherwise mangling his words in the speech at the Pittsburgh rally. I remember all the speculation about her health when Hillary was running in 2016, but there was a lot more to hang your hat on then if you were to conclude that she had medical problems. Remember when she collapsed attending a ceremony at the 9-11 memorial? and was caught and virtually thrown into the van by the Secret Service agents accompanying her? The video showed something very strange. Some sort of object appeared to fall out of her pants leg and bounce to the side. You could even hear it hit the pavement. Now I and untold numbers of others started poring over the film trying to figure out what it was. The speculation on the internet ran rampant. And as you might expect, some of the comments and speculation from coming from those who didn't like her, whether on the Republican side or Bernie Sanders supporters, was somewhat less than kind, to put it mildly. I'm not going to repeat any of that speculation, but my point is that I was absolutely drawn in. I was poring over the footage like it was the Zapruder film, as if I was going to find that the object that dropped out of her pants leg came from the grassy knoll. Okay, to be clear, that was not intended as a pun. My point is that it's very easy to be pulled into speculation in these campaigns. In the end, what always struck me as strange about the object that appeared to come out of Hillary's pant leg was that it bounced awkwardly well off to the side. Why would an object that fell out of a pant leg then hit the pavement and bounce well off to the side? Its momentum would have been down, not to the side, so it should have bounced up and perhaps a bit to the side, depending upon its shape and the way that it landed. In the end, out of the army of Internet sleuths, I recall that one person finally figured it out. If you watched incredibly closely from certain angles, you could see that the object didn't come out of her pants leg. Instead, it came from the side and hit the bottom of her pant leg. That's why it bounced to the side rather than primarily up. It bounced off her leg. In the end, it turned out to be a small pen carried by the medical staff member who was accompanying the group. She had tossed it out of her hand quickly when she saw Hillary collapsing, and she started running towards her. So why do I bring this up? Well, as much reason as there was to believe that Hillary had health problems, and she may in fact have had very serious health problems, that little piece of information the object purportedly falling out of her pants leg, 
didn't support any conclusion with regard to her health. It was a minor detail with which we all became obsessed for about 24 hours. Maybe Joe Biden's slurred speech in the Pittsburgh rally will turn out to be the same type of situation. So what did I find? I started going backwards from the date of the Pittsburgh rally to find prior Biden speeches on YouTube. What I found was interesting. If you listen to the full Joe Biden speech announcing his candidacy released last month, you'll find some of the same voice issues, but they're nowhere near as severe. Keep in mind that was a video released by the campaign. It wasn't a live speech in front of a crowd. So you know that if there was any slurring or mangling of the words of the speech comparable to what happened during the Pittsburgh rally, they would have made sure that those portions of the speech were redone before the final video was released. In fact, if slurring on that level appeared in a pre-recorded released video, you'd know there would be a serious problem with Biden's speech. That didn't happen, but what was in the pre-recorded video did hint at those problems. So then I went back to the 2016 Democrat National Convention. I watched the full speech. I found some of a hint at slurring, like what was present in the pre-recorded campaign announcement released last month. It's almost as if his teeth are too big for his mouth or his tongue is hitting them. It's a little bit like the sound of somebody talking with a small retainer in his mouth. Then I went back to the 2012 Democratic National Convention speech. There's a very slight hint of the slurring or talking with something in his mouth which is bumping into his tongue, but it's very slight. Then I went back and watched Joe Biden's speech at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. Guess what? There's no slurring. There's not even a hint of slurring. His energy level is also obviously higher. His speech is somewhat faster, but definitely more audibly powerful, more emphatic, smoother, more natural. So what's my conclusion? Just as it turned out a pen bounced off Hillary's leg rather than some part of a medical device falling out of her pants leg, after all the research, I've reached one of those obvious conclusions. This is sort of like the Ivy League federally funded scientific study, where they announced something like, people buy more food at the grocery store if they're hungry, or men find women more attractive when the men have been drinking. In the end, my conclusion is that Joe Biden is 76 years old. When he was 66 years old, he wasn't slurring his words. When he was 70 years old, there was a slight hint of slurring. When he was 74 years old, there was a somewhat more pronounced amount of slurring. When the pre-recorded video, which would have been subject to retries and editing, was released last month when he was 76 years old, there was some of the slurring. And when he spoke at a rally last month, with no opportunity for retries and editing, there was pronounced slurring. Could there be some dental work issue here? Possibly. But I don't think there necessarily is. I think he just may be getting old. And there really isn't any support for any speculation that he had a stroke or anything like that. But for those Democrats that were expecting the energetic, clear-speaking Joe Biden from 2008, they're going to be disappointed. And as this campaign grinds on, I don't expect the speech issues to dissipate. If anything, they're more likely to get worse. Political campaigns are grueling, especially at the presidential level, and Joe Biden will be under a microscope the entire time. I and many of you will be at the other end of that microscope, watching it all. Feel free to put me under a microscope as I produce a podcast for you each week. I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and follow me on Twitter at Franklin Rye. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.